So now we've actually explained two things. We've explained why the bulk of the planar waveform uh, stays planar, but we've also explained why it does bend at the edges. And notice what's it going to look like then later. Later it's going to look like this. And then it's going to look like this. These curved edges are going to keep ballooning out. If there's a small little curved edge when we're very close to the beginning over here, you can see that those curved edges are going to keep ballooning out as we get further and further. Does it form like a circle or does it just it end at some point? Uh, form a circle. Well, yeah, actually, if there's no barrier, so to be realistic, if there's no barrier, I should also be drawing the circles back here, I guess. I think. I guess, um, so yeah, if there was no barrier, so since these are spherical wavefronts, they're actually generating new waves in all directions. So I'm only showing the forward propagating wave, but I actually, I guess to be realistic, I should also be drawing these spheres behind too. So it would really be propagating in both directions. I think that's a little, bit, a little bit confusing for it, but it would really be propagating in both directions from there. If this is a spherical point source, then to be realistic, you would draw both sides of the sphere. Uh, I think for our purposes, for time being, it's more interesting to just look at the, say, the forward movement of the light. But it really would be propagating in both directions. Um, and uh, so then uh, these sections over here, I guess, yeah, you'd be getting a greater and greater spherical. So I guess it's going to kind of look like this. OK. Uh, picture is not so pretty. But yeah, that's a good point. They're not hemispherical wavelets, they're spherical wavelets. So they're really going in both directions. We know that if you like turn on a light bulb, it doesn't just shine light in one direction, it shines light in all directions. Alright, however, uh, I think I'm going to erase those backwards uh, lines because they're obscuring the other points I would think. But uh, that was a good point. Okay, now why is this uh, significant? One of the big themes in the class now is we have to distinguish between how waves behave and how particles behave. We need to distinguish between how waves and particles behave. So again, it helps to think in terms of a slit. So let's say that these horizontal lines are, represent the top and the bottom of the slit. So these horizontal lines here would be the top and the bottom of our slit. And then, so if there's really a barrier here, if this is a barrier, then we don't have to worry about that backwards propagation, right? You can't go backwards through the, uh, through the wall over here. The wall here would block the circles from continuing. So if this is just a wall, um, then the circle could not be, uh, and if there's, a, if there's like a, a little barrier here too, then they can't start propagating here because there's substance there to block them. Where's this, the slit? Is the... the slit is the bar uh, between here and here. So here's, uh, here's the wall, and here's the wall, and here's the wall, and here's the wall. So the slit is the, the empty space between these two horizontal lines. Oh. This is the bottom slit edge, and this is the top, of the edge, top edge of the slit. Okay, now the key point is, um, we, uh, this is the example we talked about last time, but we didn't really explain this uh, very well. So let's say that we have a person uh, over here. And then we have a person over here. And going back to the example we talked about, let's think about how the difference between how particles behave and um, how uh, waves behave. So the example we talked about that your instructor uses is suppose that this guy fires a gun straight forward. Well then the bullet, here's the bullet, if he fires the bullet straight forward, it's going to go like this. Because it acts like a particle. 
So is the bullet going to hit this guy? Well, no. On the other hand, suppose this guy starts talking. And let's suppose the guy is facing straight forward. So originally, um, his sound waves are going straight forward in front of him. Well, is this guy over here going to hear him? Yeah, the sound waves are still going to get there. How can the sound waves reach him when, when they were going through the slit, they were going straight ahead? When the sound waves got to the slit, they were just going straight ahead because of this bending over here. So again, this would be a good test question to use pictures like this to ex uh, explain why you can hear somebody even if you're not standing in directly in front of the doorway, say. So this is, instead of a slit, I guess we think of this as a doorway if there's actually people here. So if, there, if we have an open doorway here with walls on either side, this explains why you can hear somebody even when uh, you're standing kind of behind the barrier. Because the sound waves kind of bend around the barrier. I, I said last time I wasn't, I've never really been quite sure what diffraction means, but I think this is the best definition of diffraction. Diffraction is this idea of how waves bend when they pass through a slit or around a barrier. Diffraction is this way that the, the waves bend uh, when they're passing through a slit or around a barrier. And now we've explained why they're bending. Uh, they, bend, they, they bend at the edges because of Wiedemann's principle, because the little wavelet, um, there's a little uh, point source wavelet that's uh, creating a, a little spherical wave. That doesn't matter in the middle because all the little wavelets cancel each other out and it stays flat. But at the end, there isn't any other new point source to cancel out this one, so it bends. There is no point source over here because that's the end of the wave. Okay. Um, so anyway, this is a big difference between particles and waves. A particle does not bend around an obstacle, right? It just keeps going in a straight line if you started in a straight line. But waves do bend around an obstacle. Of course, you know this just from common sense, say, with water ripples. If there were water ripples going through a slit here, you know that once it got through, the waves would start spreading out to the sides. Yeah, it's just our common sense that waves kind of spread out once they get through a, an opening. And we know that sound waves work that way, uh, too. There was a there was a uh, argument for a long time in history about whether light was a particle or a wave. Yeah. Um, well, if you can measure that the light is kind of spreading out when it goes through an opening, that's evidence that it has wave characteristics. Because a particle, you would not think would do that. Okay. Uh, all right. So you have to keep in mind what the different characteristics of a particle and a wave uh, are. Now, when is this bending important? Well, this, this is only important when the wave has a lot of wave characteristics to it, as if it's very wavy. Uh, and it turns out that the bigger the wavelength, the bigger the wavelength is, the more important the wave characteristics of the wave are. So the smaller your wavelength, the less important the wave characteristics are. Or putting it another way, the smaller the wavelength, the more something acts like a particle. The smaller the wavelength, the more it acts like a particle. I guess we could think that a particle, you can almost think of a particle as a wave with a wavelength of zero. It's kind of like the limiting case. Okay. All right, um, so I actually haven't, we haven't quite explained why a bigger wavelength means your wave characteristics are more important. Maybe we'll get to that eventually. But just as a memory aid, the word wavelength has the word wave in it. So it's easy to remember that the wavelength measures your wave properties. The bigger your wavelength, the more you act like a wave. And if you had a, a wavelength of zero, well, you're not really like a wave at all at that point. So what's the alternative? You're like a particle. There's no, obviously no such thing as a wave with a wavelength of zero. Um, and so uh, that would have to be acting like a particle. So one of the big themes of the course is going to be, remember I was just saying that there was this big historical argument about whether light was a wave or a particle. Well, you may know that the upshot of that it was that the scientists eventually had to decide that it has some wave characteristics and it also has some particle characteristics. It really has the characteristics of both a wave and a particle. Sometimes it's useful to focus on the wave characteristics and sometimes it's useful to focus on the particle characteristics, but both of those exist. Um, and then it turned out that everything is like that. Even the things that we think are particles actually have wave characteristics too. Even the things that you oh, think are wavelengths are just so small that they don't, you don't really notice that they're... Exactly. Yeah, that's the exact right explanation. So for example, um, even say this chalk holder. All right, it certainly doesn't seem like a wave, right? It seems like a particle, but that's just because it has a teensy tiny wavelength. The wavelength is so small um, 
compared to uh, the wavelength is so small, relatively speaking here, um, that we don't notice the wave characteristics uh, of this. Um, however, they, uh, they, uh, they still exist. Everything has both wave and particle characteristics. You just have to decide which are the characteristics that are most useful for solving the problem that you're working on. And again, what matters is the relative wavelength. When the, rel when the wavelength is relatively big, the wave characteristics are important. And when the wavelength is relatively small, it's the particle characteristics that are important.